Hi, Prem. Can you hear me okay? Check, check. I'm assuming we're all good. Um, so for today's session, Rich posted a question on the forum. I'm assuming he can't make it, but he was curious about um, a note that I gave on his of the version of the window shards, where I mentioned that some of the windows look like they had a delayed activation, and you can use uh, a growing activation to uh, have this slow expansion of shattering from the main impact point. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. I'm going to talk about some things I've set up to render this with Redshift. Um, I have not used Redshift prior to this project, so I would by no means consider myself an expert, but I did go through quite a lot of testing with uh, various options for instancing sections versus not and et cetera. Um, so I'll give you, you know, just a quick description of how I approached the render for it. Um, actually, maybe we'll start with that. And of course, as always, if anyone has any questions, feel free to shout them out in the chat. Let's open my last rendering scene. Hopefully it'll just take a moment for this to open up here. Um, so I was pretty impressed when I first started using Redshift because I had a pretty awful uh, graphics card with only two gig of VRAM and it still managed to render uh, this really heavy scene which I assume most other GPU renders probably would have had a hard time with. It must have been going out of core beyond my VRAM capabilities, but it still managed pretty okay with the scene. Of course, it's a lot better um, now that I have a nicer card, but that's just to say that you don't have to have something super fancy in order to experiment with doing Redshift renders yourself. Um, there were a few things that I had to get used to. The sampling works very different from what you'd expect in Mantra. Um, Mantra will default to, I believe it's three samples. Um, whereas, you know, if you want to do something very highly sampled in Mantra, then you'd set it to, I don't know, for some final production quality renders with lots of motion blur on some fine layers like Sparks. I've seen Mantra samples up around 20 that's if we go dive in here under the rendering tab. Actually, this is a little bit different than the wrapper we have at work, but the pixel samples here. Um, I rarely go, you know, I, I never get anywhere near 20 typically. Uh, usually I'm just doing test renders. Maybe I'll do six or nine samples. Often I'll just leave it at three. But with Redshift, you have to go much higher with your sample settings. Uh, there's a good video out there. There are a lot of good videos out there for Redshift in general, uh, but there's one in particular I saw that talks about their unified sampler settings a bit uh, that will describe it much better than I could, but just to give you a good starting point, I found that um, this min samples of 16 and max of 512 uh, was, you know, it seemed very noise-free in my case, and it seemed um, quite fast as well. So this seems like a good starting point, which is drastically different from what you would expect in uh, your Mantra settings. Um, I tried to do instancing for all of the building pieces, uh, writing out RS proxies for each piece to disk, and then having that driven by points at render time. Um, and instancing has worked very well for the glass shards <clears throat> and for debris and that sort of thing. But for the whole building, um, I don't know, if, you know, I was running into some sort of a bug, uh, but it didn't work at all any of the times I tried to get it working with the full building. So feel free to test if you'd like, but I had nothing but crashes. Um, so I just rendered this uh, directly with, out of the transform pieces output. So if we just dive into our posts and tweaks section. So we have, you can ignore some of this extra stuff that I've done to experiment with instancing for the building, but we basically just have our normal proxy pieces at their rest pose. Let me set this to show all objects. 
And then we have our transformed version of that. Actually, it's, let me turn off other things, hide other objects. And yeah, you can just render this directly. That's what I did. And um, I also object merged in my render node, the static building as well. Uh, for the window shards though, that's a very good case for instancing. Since we have a much limited number of instances we're applying, we don't have you know, 20,000 or 40,000 unique pieces. We have a much smaller number. So for that, um, I've taken the output of my reconnected glass shards. It'll just take a moment for that to cook here. So yes, this is all of our, all the glass shards instances that are reconnected after the sim. And um, when I was working on this instancing, it seemed like you should be able to just use these points directly. Because um, the idea for instancing is we just want to have a point for each individual glass shard that'll have information about a file on disk that it's instancing onto those. Uh, kind of like we set up with the normal debris setup. Um, but I tried doing that just by deleting out the prims and then using these points with the transform data applied to them. Uh, and it didn't seem to work and I, a lot of other people ran into problems with this workflow as well. And it doesn't seem like it should matter, but with these Redshift instances, it seemed like it was much less problematic if instead of, you know, just dropping in an add SOP and setting that to, well, connecting it, and then delete geometry, we keep the points. And we would all, before deleting the geometry and keeping the points, you would have to, you know, transform the, the transform matrix from the packed prims onto the points for instancing, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Um, but you should be able to just use these points as your basis for instancing. Uh, but strangely enough, it doesn't uh, seem to like that, at least in the tests I've done and in some of the uh, posts I've seen on Oddforce. Um, and it seems to work a lot better if you just generate a new set of points. So here I've created a spare input and connected our instance glass shards to the spare input of this point generate. And then I'll use this endpoints function, looking at input minus one, which is that spare input, to create the number of points we need for this frame. In this case, it's 19,000 points. And then I'll put that into the first input of a wrangle. And in the second input, I'll attach all of these actual glass shards. And you can save this bit of vex. Uh, this is definitely a good one to copy and refer back to later in case you need to set this up in the future. And so we're just essentially copying some attributes from the glass shards onto these generated points. You don't see anything from this point generate because um, you know, we're referencing the glass shards to know how many points we're generating, but it's just generating those down at the origin. It looks like one, but it's actually, you know, all 19,000 points down at the origin there. And then in this wrangle, uh, we're just looking up attributes from our glass shards. We're grabbing the position of each of those shards, just that P attribute. And then we're looking up the intrinsic information for all the shards as well. So, uh, I know we've looked at this a few times, but all of these glass shard transformations are stored in these intrinsic transforms. So if you go to the spreadsheet and under intrinsics, let's grab the transform. <clears throat> and this gives you the full transform matrix. There's a pivot as well. And we're grabbing both of these intrinsic attributes from the glass shards input and storing those on our points as normal attributes. Instead of an intrinsic attribute, I've just created a normal attribute called transform and one called pivot. And these names have to be that exactly because Redshift instancing is expecting, you know, to find these specifically named attributes to define those transformations. Um, I'm also grabbing velocity and W 
And you can choose in the Redshift instancer whether you use velocity or a subframe for that motion blur. Um, what else to know? This is another weird thing that was um, a bit of a pain. If, if normally we would just set the instance file attribute directly. And I found that uh, oftentimes when I'm pointing these instance files to a Redshift proxy, that uh, my Houdini would often crash when I tried to display this. Uh, we might be able to stop that crashing potentially by going into our display settings and let's see, is it under geometry? Yeah. Maybe by turning off point instancing here, we can avoid the problem. Um, and this is a hard crash that so would just completely kill Houdini. Um, but to help avoid the problem, I would just call this temp instance file instead. Um, so that, you know, wouldn't try to display those instances at all. And then in the renderer, um, which we'll look at in a moment, I just rename this attribute um, just before rendering from temp instance file to instance file. It's a silly little hack that you shouldn't have to do, but um, it, it seemed to help out in my case. Um, and as I mentioned, these are instancing Redshift proxies. Now, if you try to instance any other geometry types uh, like BGO or Alembic or something like that, um, I think Alembic or I think the latest Redshift builds may support some of those, but it might be a bit slower because it needs to convert the meshes into its own rendering format. And pretty much any renderer would do this. Um, at least as far as I know, um, you know, if you render in RenderMan, it probably needs to build all of that geometry in a format that RenderMan expects. Uh, some of these things are changing. I think there are plans. Um, it might be in some of the experimental builds, I don't know, for Redshift to directly read Alembic formats uh, without converting them, but I'm not sure about that. All of this rendering tech is always evolving. So it you know, takes a lot to keep on top of all the changes. But, um, but yeah, so I just wanted to create Redshift proxies so this could be as fast as possible. Um, so to create those proxies, we just start with all of these instance shapes down here. And I start by moving those to the origin if they aren't already. In this case, they already were. Um, but I always just leave that in there just to be safe. And then do, I do this piece per frame thing that we already looked at in the debris setups, I believe. So if you go to frame 15, that's just one shard. And instead of caching these to disk as BGO, I'm just cleaning up all the attributes that we won't need. Uh, we don't even need the name or anything for this. I'm just uh, leaving just the normals and the UVs and the inside info. And then I'm using this Redshift proxy output to write those proxies to disk. And just like we did with the debris instances, I set this to go from a start frame of zero up through the number of instance objects, minus one. And I set this up with spare inputs down at the bottom. You can see that's pointing to um, this input here to determine the number of instances we're creating. In this case, it's 35. So this uh, Redshift proxy output will run from 0 to 34. And then for the file name, I've pointed this to you know, my caches directory and glass shards with a version number. And then I've embedded the name into the actual instance name. So if we go back to uh, the the actual proxies directory here. You can see this is called glass shards dot whatever the name of the piece is dot rs. And this helps us to create instance file references on our points that will match up to these files. So, you know, we have all of these glass shards. At least we, oh, sorry, we have to go to a valid frame, of course. Just take a moment to cook that. All right. So we have all the glass shards. We're creating the points to match those. 
and then we're copying the point positions and intrinsic transforms. And then finally, to build that instance file, um, you could be smarter about this and do a channel reference and then a string replace to insert the original name instead of uh, this hard-coded string. But essentially, I just have a hard-coded string for now that matches the path for the Redshift proxy output. And then I'm just inserting the original name for each glass shard. Now, all of these glass shards have both the unique name and the original name. If I pull up the spreadsheet, which you might not be able to see very well, um, this name attribute, actually, not there. Let's see, if we middle mouse here, you can see the name attribute has uh, 19,000 different uh, values. So those are all unique names on the points. And there's a name a ridge attribute with just 35 unique values. So one for each possible instance. And it looks like we have uh, the name value on prims with only 35 unique values. So that matches name a ridge on the points. Typically, it's a good idea to avoid uh, having the same attributes on both points and prims. In this case, we have you know uh, two name attributes representing different things. So that's a little bit sloppy, and I'd watch out for that. It's not necessarily a problem, um, but better to be avoided. Um, and it's possible, I think I might have seen Alembic exports not like that sometimes. But in any case, we're just embedding not the unique name, but the original instance name into that instance file path. And then if we go to the actual object that we're rendering, because I've, as I always say, you know, I don't point the mantra or redshift ROPs to render our setup nodes directly. I always set up these geometry nodes here. And if we look at the window shards, um, if you set up, uh, if you install Redshift, you will have a Redshift shelf. And if you don't have object parameters on your geometry node, you can just create this, or click this object params button, that will create this Redshift tab. So on here, we don't really have to change much. Um, under the render, I just gave it a different object ID, which may or may not be useful to you. Uh, it's kind of an optional step if you want to write out an object ID pass or puzzle mats. But then under instancing, uh, you can use either Redshift instances or sometimes uh, using this Redshift point clouds can be faster. So I would try maybe point clouds first. Um, I don't know all the cases in which you have to use instances instead of point clouds, but you can check the docs for that. Um, you can choose whether you're using velocity or a subframe motion blur. And then this one's very important. You want to uncheck the pivot, uh, the ignore pivot attribute option uh, because we're copying over that pivot from our glass shards uh, from the intrinsic attributes. So we definitely want to turn off this ignore option here. Uh, and other than that, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, ah, there's one more thing though regarding this and let me set this to manual so that I don't crash my Houdini based on that instance file weirdness I mentioned earlier. Um, it didn't seem like it would respect the material on instances if I tried to define it here. For regular geometry, it seems to be okay with it. Like for the window panes, I just specified it here and it was fine. But for instances, it didn't seem to work so I used a material SOP to specify that in an attribute. And because these are just points that are we're importing, these are this object merge just points to those uh, instance points that we set up based on our glass shard geometry. And uh, we don't have any prims on that point cloud. So on this material, just make sure this attribute type is set to point attributes instead of the default primitive. And then you can point this to whatever, um, yeah, whatever your material is. So I know that was kind of a quick 
well, a partially quick, partially long-winded run through for some of the approach to the instancing and the render. Um, that's the bulk of it. I'm trying to think if there were any other important things regarding the render. Um, one thing that's tricky is a motion blur uh, for changing topology. And this is one of those things that um, at work in production, you'll find yourself spending a lot of your time debugging. Um, it's one of the more annoying parts of the job, but um, for a good destruction TD, being able to dis to debug motion blur issues is one of the most important skills to have. Um, and you know, I find when doing lead work for destruction shots, most of the time that I'm helping people with things, it's making sure that uh, they're caching things out in a way that the motion blur works. Um, it can be annoyingly difficult sometimes. In any case, um, the window panes, the way that we have them set up, uh, this is changing topology because we're blasting them. So if I bring back my scene updating, I'll display that. And because we're using a blast based on the active frame, that means our point count is always changing. So it can't use subframes to determine motion blur. Um, in this case, it doesn't really matter because uh, you know the, these things aren't moving, so they don't need any geometry motion blur. Um, but one thing to be aware of is that if you merge this together with geometry that is moving, then you'll run into some issues. So in this case, I had started by merging it, uh, merging it together with the glass edges, and of course. These glass edges are moving, and they need to have blur applied. But if you try to bring in both the window panes and the glass edges, then the whole thing has changing topology, and it doesn't know how to motion blur it. Uh, so I set these things up separately. Um, so the window panes are in, their, in one geometry node because we don't need to worry about whether this is interpolating at all, position-wise. Um, actually, I say that now. It's possible this could still be problematic depending on the renderer. Um, I think it's OK. It, there's, you have to watch out for this. Even though these things are not moving, it's possible that the changing topology could be a problem. Uh, Redshift. I saw in the warnings was detecting that this is changing topology. So it's using a uh, looking for velocity instead, uh, which this doesn't have. So it just doesn't motion blur this geometry. And that's safer to keep that separate from the window edges, because this is just going to blur by interpolation. And we're not actually deleting these glass edges. If we display all the points, even at the beginning, where we don't see glass edges, those points are still there. They're just scaled down to zero. And in this case, that works pretty well. Um, you do have to watch out sometimes when doing these scaling hacks, because sometimes when things appear, you can get some slight motion blur weirdness. Um, oftentimes, you don't see it. Sometimes you do. Uh, with these explosive windows, it can be a bit more forgiving um, because at the moment that it shatters, if there's a little bit of extra motion blur streaking, you might not see the issue. Um, so you may need to experiment with a bit to make sure that all of your uh, caching decisions and motion blur decisions are working properly. Uh, but it seemed to work out well enough in my case. All right, let's see, anything else on rendering? Any other questions so far? Nothing yet? Cool. Let's see. All right, so uh, with, I think we can leave the rendering alone for now. Um, was there anything else? Yeah, that'll be good enough. Um, I also want to talk a bit about this um, glass activation that Rich asked about. 
Let me just save this as a different file in case I break things. All right, so let's see. Let's go to our glass shatter setup again. Now for this, let's first take a look uh, at Rich's uh, glass submission last week. So there's this weird delay that's happening. One sec. So yeah, after the initial delay, you can see that these pieces stay pretty intact. Uh, with all of these glass panes that are right on the edge of that destruction, you'd expect all of this, uh, this damage to affect those as well. Um, it's okay for there to be some lingering window panes in the destruction area, but it, in this case, it looks a little bit weird, especially because they all shatter together shortly afterwards, and it seems pretty unmotivated. Um, so the first thing I would check in this case is the active frame value that these pieces are getting. So I'm trying to see if those building sections actually activate or actually start moving at the point when the glass shatters. Yeah, you can see all these glass shatters starting to happen, but it doesn't look like the building's being destroyed. So I would, uh, I would tweak the active frame values to avoid that problem. I would double check uh, the active frame values on all the pieces. If you're doing a whole bunch of posts and tweaks, then you may need to um, rerun your activation check. So if you remember from our post sim tweaks, let's jump back there for a moment. The very first thing we did at the beginning of this setup was we brought in our raw simulation points without any tweaks, and then we computed the active frame value. So if we display that, this will cook for a moment. This is computing the active frame based on the actual movement of the pieces. Now, it's possible that um, when you're doing a whole bunch of post sim tweaks, like all of this extra stuff we're doing to this, that uh, you might be freezing the pieces without changing their active frame or something. Basically, if you make changes to the geometry without updating the active frame attribute to match, then the active frame might get out of sync with what's actually happening on your geometry. So you could potentially um, take this exact active frame setup that we're doing back here, and you can copy that and also run it at the very end just before caching out your points. So all the way down here, just before the file cache, um, you could just recompute all of those active frames. Of course, this is going a bit slow. Anyway, we don't need to wait for this all to recook. Um, let's go back to the shattered windows. Uh, one thing I've mentioned on this version, though, is that it could also look cool to have uh, an expansion from that impact point. So, <clears throat> There are a couple ways we could do this. So basically, you know, after he hits the building here, it would be pretty nice to see um, over the course of a handful of frames that shatter sort of expand outward radially. And there are lots of ways you could set this up. Let's take a look at some of them. I'm just going to start with my windows without any active frames applied to them. And I'll just work on some sort of alternate um, alternate setup here. So let's also blast away the active ones. I'm just checking to see what my current activation looks like. OK. All right, so let's start by, let's see, what's a good way to do this? Um, 
let's base the activation on the uh, impact of the monster. So uh, let's try by starting with the VDB of the monster. Let's import him from object assets monster. Actually, we can use the convex halls as well. That could potentially be faster than using the actual monster mesh. So I'll bring in week three monster collider and out collide. And let's see, maybe we could, let's bring in a version of the building in its rest state. So let's object merge in week five, posts and tweaks. And we'll grab, let's see, out final proxies. And I'll time shift that to frame 985. And I'm going to unpack that. All right, so let's see. There's so many different ways of setting up these growth things. I always have to kind of figure it out from scratch. Uh, yeah, I'm going to shrink wrap this building and we're going to get the intersection with the monster. And so let's take our, our monster here, we'll do VDB from polygons. We'll get an SDF of the animated monster. This can be pretty low res. I'll try 0.3 looks pretty low res, that'll work. Let's see, on the time shift for this building, I didn't freeze the frame, so let me do that. So we just have this static uh, frame of the building here. And let's get an SDF intersection. Oop, not by an SDF intersection node, we want VDB combine. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll pipe in the building and the VDB of the monster. And we'll set this operation to SDF intersection. And if you scrub through, you can see this will give us all of those intersection points with the building. Cool. So let's, um, let's see, let's tag the, uh, let's set up a new activation frame. So by default, we should have set up some sort of active frame. Nope, let's see, how do we do this? Oh yeah, we just did a basic attribute transfer from our sim points before. In this case, we're going to do some sort of an accumulation. I'll copy this active frame of 10,000 here, and I'll set that as the value for all of these windows. So let's, um, let's just grab each of those windows here, and we're giving these all an active frame of 10,000. Let's pull this all off to the side so it doesn't get confused with our main setup. All right. So let's see, a couple different ways. We could run a solver to accumulate this VDB here. So let's try that this way. We might take a look at a few different ways. So I'll drop in a solver and inside the solver, uh, our input is going to be this current intersection point of the monster in the building. And on every frame, we can combine that with the previous intersection point. So we'll just do another VDB combine within the solver here with our current input combined with the previous frame. And we'll do an SDF intersection. 
And of course, we always want to add in an output. So now if we step through this here, see, I was gonna say we should see this accumulating intersection, but we don't. See, did I do something wrong here? Hmm. Reset that sin. So input one looks like that's always correct. This previous frame though is not giving us anything useful. So interesting, so on this input one here, you can see we have a valid bit of VDB. Um, on this previous frame, it's not bringing in anything. And, oh, I see what we're doing. Silly mistake. Um, I set this to SDF intersection, but we want to accumulate this. We don't want to um, just find the intersection point. If we leave this on intersection, then it's going to, on each of these frames, try to only find the air overlapping areas with the previous frame. Definitely is not what we want. So to accumulate this instead, let's add this to, or let's flip this to SDF union. And now let's jump outside here and display the solver. So now you can see this is accumulating all of those regions. Cool. And right now this is going to give us a VDB only for the area that the monster actually touches. And I should also note that these kinds of setups um, are very useful, not just for, you know, a destruction situation like this. There are lots of, you know, various types of effects that can benefit from interesting ways of accumulating growth. So feel free to, you know, brainstorm what other things you can use this for. Um, so inside here, we can grow the previous frame on every single frame. So if we add in a reshape, drop in a VDB reshape SDF, And sorry, we'll switch or leave this on dilate. Let's check the previous frame. I'll see how much that's dilating it. Uh, it looks like a decent setting for a first test. So now as we step through this, you can see that it's not just accumulating the area of intersection, that uh, area is constantly growing as well. So now we can use this to set an active frame on our windows. It's pretty neat. All right. Um, we'll do some basic grouping. So maybe we'll run another solver on all of these windows here. Um, yeah, let's create another solver, windows in the first input the VDBs and the second. And then, let's see, what do we want to do? We want to compare the previous frame. Actually, yeah, let, let's always group our input windows with our input VDB to see if it's contained within that VDB and in which case we'll activate it. So we'll do a group We'll set this group type to, um, uh, sorry, group type to points, turn off the base group, turn on the bounding regions and set that to bounding volume. It looks like it's grouping one window pane there. Yep. And we'll just call this group activate. And let's see, uh, after that, we're going to set up the active frame based on the activation group. 
So that's a point attribute. So we'll drop in a point wrangle. We'll set this group to the activate group. And we'll say um, at active frame is equal to uh, the minimum between the current frame or the previously set frame. Because once we set an active frame, on any subsequent frames, we don't want to update that. We want this, you know, once it's set to maintain that earliest activation. So let's compare that to the previous frame with the second input there. So we'll grab the minimum between the current frame and the input uh, from input one, active frame attributes, and the point number PT num. And hopefully I set this up right, because it's very easy to run into logic mistakes when working in solvers like this. I'll call this accumulate activation. Now in the solver here, let's blast away the activated pieces. So I'm just going to copy that blast so we can see what we're actually doing. So now you can see these pieces are being blasted as they activate. We can also, um, maybe I'll convert our volume to polys so we can see what that looks like. So do VDB convert. I'll pipe that SDF solver into that, convert it to polys, maybe give it a little adaptivity to make it more low res. So now you can see as this grows, this is activating those windows. Cool. So it looks like our activation frame is working correctly based on that growth. And we can actually use a combination of different uh, techniques to activate this building. Um, so what we could do is we can take this active frame and then maybe take the active frames we got from the actual simulation here. So we have that activation and we have this, wait, not that one. <laughs> we have our normal activation based on the movement of the simulation where we just copy that over from our simulation points, not there, from here. Um, so we can combine this with the other one we calculated and just take the minimum value. So let's, uh, let's drop in a time shift after the solver. Whenever you're running solvers to accumulate things like this, uh, sometimes you just want the end result. You don't want to keep calculating this frame to frame on the fly. And we're just going to drop in a time shift connect that to the solver, and you can either change this expression to RF end, which will be 1150. This will just take a moment to cook. We don't necessarily need to wait for this to go all the way. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just stop it now. You can also decide how far you want this to go so if we display the blast after that solver, you can say we don't want to do any activation after, I don't know, frame 1030 or something. So we could cap it there. I'll set the time shift to frame 1030. So it'll only accumulate up to that point. So drop the time shift after the solver, call that freeze at 1030. And now our blast will show us that it's not accumulating any further than that. So that's cool. Um, now we can compare that to the active frame values that we got uh, copied over here. Um, so we can just drop in a wrangle for the, and we'll just do a 
compare active frame, or we'll just call it maybe minimum active frame because that's really what we're checking. And in the first input, we'll grab the windows here with the active frame based on the sim. And the second one, uh, we don't want the blast, we'll grab this time shifted VDB accumulation thing. And then in here, we'll just do another minimum check. I'll we'll say at active frame is equal to the minimum value between uh, the first input, so just active frame, and the second input, so input one, active frame attribute for PT num. And now this will grab the minimum activation frame between both versions. So let's connect our blast to that to see what that looks like. Because we don't want to just base it on this activation growth thing. Because if you start having portions of the building shattering, then you might want, um, you know, or you don't want your panes to be floating because they haven't been activated by the growth yet. So this is going, it's not very obvious, um, you know, where it's pulling its active frame from. But it's essentially, yeah, it's grabbing the minimum between your two inputs. Um, so this is one option. Uh, you, you could do something like this to colorize or to activate uh, some of these expanding pieces. Um, you could uh, confine this to a certain group rather than the entire uh, entirety of your windows. So you could say that uh, maybe we just run this on uh, the windows within a certain section. So you can see how <clears throat> based on this activation, it's wrapping all the way around uh, this whole section of the building. But maybe we just want that to happen on the top half of the building there. So on this minimum active frame, I'm going to do a selection based on, let's see if these have unique paths on this window. Looks like it's all one path attribute, so that won't work. Let's try the name attribute instead which does work. So you could, you could also use a, a world position. So we can select this and hit enter. And that will automatically enter the selection into our point wrangle here. Although it looks like it didn't use our name attribute. Let's see, I'm not sure why. Oh, it looks like uh, the name attribute is not a primitive attribute here. It's on points. So flip to point selection based on name. Now if we, nope, did that work? Sometimes these, this, uh, this you know, hot group changing thing can be a little bit finicky. Is this working? Anyway, yeah, I'm not sure why that's not working properly. You can specify the group separately without doing this little shortcut. <clears throat> you can also, of course, do this based on size. So right now it's doing it for everything. Or, sorry, not on size, based on position. So let's just maybe apply this only to pieces on the top half. So I'll say at P sub uh, one for the Y dimension is greater than 15. So now we just have the top half affected by that activation growth, whereas the bottom half is based only on the activation we're getting from that sim. So that, you know, can help you to mix and match techniques a little bit. Um, you could also not rely on these sort of procedural setups and just do it by hand. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing things by hand. I do a lot by hand all the time. So you could, instead of, you know, doing this out of control growth thing that, you know, once this is activated, we 
the way it's currently set up, we have no way to control a limit to this growth. It's, we kind of set up the rules and it does its thing, uh, but we could, um, you could be much more manual about this. So let's display our building here. And maybe we'll hand animate a section. So let's not base this on this VDB intersection whatsoever. Let's set up uh, just a manual sphere here. And let's, um, yeah, let's display that. Move this into place. All right, so maybe let's, you know, let's say we hand place this right where the monster's hand would be, and we can manually control this activation here. So maybe I'll say, um, maybe I'll just give, give this a fit-based animation. Let's see what's going slowly when I scrub this. Oh yeah, so we're displaying all the moving proxies. I just wanna see the time shifted frozen in place proxies. So maybe let's take a look at Rich's thing. Uh, we don't have the frame numbers available here. Let's say this is frame 1020 here. And we want this expansion to happen up through frame, I don't know, maybe 1060 or something. So let's do a fit function. I'll say fit function at frame from 1020 to 1060. And we're going to scale this from zero up through, uh, let's see how big eight is. Cool, that's plenty big enough. All right, now we can use this uh, for our volume accumulation here. So if you remember this first solver we set up um, is just a volume accumulator. It doesn't really care what the input is. So, you know, on one hand, we just used the intersection with the monster in the building. In this case, we can just use a sphere. So I'll just convert that to a VDB, do a VDB from polygons. Doesn't have to be very high res. I'll make that 0.3 again. And actually, you know what, for this, we don't even need to uh, accumulate this because we just have this growing per frame. So we're not going to worry about this accumulator whatsoever. We're going to go right to this um, active frame detection. So I'll call this activate from VDB. And instead of this growing one, based on that intersection here. We're just going to, oh, hopefully I'm not getting too careless with scrubbing all over and crashing things. Um, we're just going to plug in our manually animated sphere. And of course you can keyframe this to your liking. Um, you can get as manual as you want. You can play around with the slope on your keyframes and everything to get exactly the expansion that you want. So let's, uh, yeah, so we just pipe in this VDB for that sphere. And then this, well, we can get rid of that time shift freeze at 1030. This will probably change to 1060 because that was the end of our sphere animation. Connect our blast to that. Mm, looks like we have to reset the sim or something. So sure enough, if we template display our sphere here and look at that solver output, you can see that we have this activation just based on that sphere. And now we can keep this minimum active frame check where we're comparing that to the original active frame from the sim. 
and we're blasting based on that. So right now, we probably won't see too much different because our sphere comes on later. You can see that it's animating in after these areas have already been shattered. But if we, uh, for example, change the frame range on our sphere animation, so if, let's make this go from 985 to 1010, just for the sake of example, or 990, we'll say, to 1010. And we'll have to reset the solver. And now, <clears throat> if we scrub through our activation, you can see that the sphere activation is mixing with the sim activation. And we're activating these pieces before the sim actually hits them. And this is a good way to just kind of art direct ex the activation exactly how you want it. Um, you know, because in production, you might get a note that everything here looks amazing. Don't change anything at all. Just make this one area, you know, activate these windows over the course of a handful of frames. Um, so, you know, that's why having all of these different tools to art direct your setup can be very helpful, you know, mix and match procedural things with, you know, manual tweaks where you don't have to completely change things. You can kind of plug in different options, make it affect just very specific areas. And yeah, it's very, uh, very useful to combine all of these techniques for your final shot. <clears throat> and it looks like that uses up all of our time today. Um, I think if there are any final things um, that I want to mention before we wrap up here. Um, of course, if you have any more questions, feel free to drop me an email or post on the forum. And for my students, I'm always happy to you know, take a look at your demo reel and such as well if you want any extra input on that. Um, but yeah, I hope everybody's enjoyed the class and that you've all learned a lot from it. And I hope to run into some of you uh, in the course of working here. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll see you around in the biz. Um, always feel free to introduce yourself, um, you know, whether it's at a convention or anything like that. Um, I try to stay active in Houdini events. Um, I did SIGGRAPH last year and FMX this year, and I'll be doing a few Houdini events in Japan next week. And um, I will be adding um, an email list sign up form to my website sometime within the next week. Um, I believe I also posted a link to the sign up on my LinkedIn. So if you want to stay in the loop about any, you know, future, you know, tutorials or Houdini tools or, um, you know, talks and presentations and such that I might be doing, feel free to sign up for that. And yeah, I wish everybody the best of luck and yeah, good luck with all of your smashing and destruction and future effects work.